Hello, welcome to the Vanguard Show on podcast. Today is March 19th, 2023. The Vanguard is being sponsored by the book and photo exhibit from Old Guard to Vanguard. And today we have some extra special guests. We have author, writer, Sean Dale R. Johnson and John Bunchy Creer of the Black Panther Party, People's Party 2, National Headquarters and renowned photographer. So again, I wanna thank uh, both of you for coming on this morning. Yeah, glad to Thank be here. you for having us. Absolutely. Well, we have to talk about this fantastic book. I finished it, The People's Lawyer by Shondell R. Johnson and attorney Bobby Caldwell. I see my uh, screen is kind of messing up a little bit, but hopefully we'll get through it. But uh, tell me uh, again how, uh, how you got involved in the, uh, the book, writing the book and your relationship to uh, Attorney Caldwell, I'll go uh, ladies first and then uh, Comrade Bunchy. <laughs> well, for starters, I married into the Caldwell Johnson family. So my husband is actually Bobby Caldwell's nephew, okay. one of six boys. And he told us some years ago, at least 10, probably around 2007, after the Black Panthers honored him in Houston, that he was writing a book, or he at least wanted to write a book. Okay. And at the time, this is not what I was doing. Um, I was doing the stay-at-home mom thing, chasing little kids around the house. But I've always loved to read and write. And I didn't offer any ideas. I just said, OK, and was waiting for the book to come out. And it never happened. So over time, he just kept talking about it. And he had gotten a diagnose, a, a miss diagnosed of cancer last I believe it was March and we went down there and spent some time with him and he was still talking about this book and I said well what happened with the book and he said nothing happened so and if you knew him he had this this voice I just loved how he said some things and I said what do you mean nothing happened well one of the people who he had been meeting with had passed away and he has money like he paid them and nothing ever happened. And I said, so what needs to happen at this point? And I just started asking him a lot of questions that I asked my clients now that I'm doing this. And when I got the information that I needed, I said, well, I can help you with that. Like, all we need to do is sit down together. You need to tell me your story mm -hmm. and then we can go from there. And that's what we did. Uh, we spent a lot of time together over the last six months or so. I had been back and forth to Houston. We've been on phone calls. When he had an idea, he would call me and tell me. Uh, when we got to meet together, I would literally be with him and my laptop, just taking okay. all the notes that I could get so that I could put them together for him. And we did that until this past December. I spent about a, a week out there with him. That was the first time I met Uncle Daddy in okay. person. <laughs> okay. And we actually did a Zoom with him and Uncle James Aaron. Um, I got to meet a lot of activists and um, Attorney Jean Locke, who he represented, Uncle Omar Wiley. You're going to laugh because everybody's my uncle now. Like okay. I lost one <laughs> uncle and got five new uncles. <laughs> and, right. and it was just the going through the process and it wasn't something I had planned to do. I feel like it just fell in my lap and I took off with it and ran with it after he passed before he passed he said I was the bald head that needed to be shined I had <laughs> never heard that I felt like that was some real old gangster kind of conversation but I understood that he was telling me I was the HNIC so oh. I did get that part and so I I feel like that's why I have to keep the project going and I'm so grateful that I've made the connections that I've made because Uncle Daddy really is just pulling me along with him. I feel like I'm riding his coattails and I'm thankful for that because I, I feel like that's what Uncle Bobo would have wanted. Right on, right on. And Comrade John Bunch Career, I tell you, you are a living legend, brother. And talk about your relationship with uh, attorney uh, Bobby Caldwell as well as your involvement with the book. Yeah, well, you know, with, with Bobby, uh, he was our attorney as well as a lot of others. So, you know, that's the first time I met him. It really was at his office, but, uh, you know, right, made, right, right away, he made you feel comfortable, like he was in your corner. Mm -hmm. And then, um, 
over the years, uh, you know, uh, after the fight, you know, he became a, you know, a good friend, uh, somebody you love to spend time with and, uh, uh, and just be around. And, uh, you know, he was still the same person as far as uh, when it came to injustice and, and our people, he, uh, he was still the same person. You know, all the way up in time, so time is passing. He 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 uh, he believed on. We'd be talking, and maybe me and some of the comrades would be at the house, and he'd say he saw something on TV. We need to check this out. Or something was happening with somebody, and that you know it wasn't right. And we need to check this out or whatever. So, you know, he he was always conscious of the uh, injustice and the inhumanities uh, in society. And, um, you know, he, he loved to have me around. I went to Washington, D.C. with him, um, you know, with his uh, uh, high school uh, alumni association. Okay. And uh, we, we spent a good weekend. And, uh, you know, we went to the uh, Smithsonian, you know, the African American Museum. And uh, really, I have to go back because I, I, because Bobby, we would be bribed by something. He say, "Oh, I know that person. I'm gonna, uh, yeah, <laughs> all right, let's go." <laughs> you know, okay, all right. So, so we went through there fast, you know. Right. But uh, yeah, but he, now that, uh, he, he was, uh, and really, he's still not getting his due, but he was a living legend. Mm. You know, uh, Ralph Cooper, who's a sports right here, but Ralph started out as a uh, just a journalist. In fact, he covered uh, Carl's assassination, and just like he said that uh, Bobby was one of the most 10 important Black people that have lived here in Houston as far as the struggle. Wow. And, uh, and, and, and he's right about that. Well, I was going to say, I got through the book, and it is fantastic, 15 chapters, I mean, from the introduction to the closing, your tribute that you wrote as well, brother. And I got to give a special shout out to James Aaron, comrade uh, Boko, and his wife, Sister Keela, who are also very close to uh, attorney Bobby Caldwell. Again, fantastic read. Uh, it was done with love, I could tell. And and what would both of you want to, to uh, tell people who didn't know uh, about uh, uh, attorney Caldwell's work in the community? Personally, After reading this story, I'll have to say that because we just knew uh, he was an attorney and we knew he worked with the Black Panthers. Like that's literally all we knew in the family. But doing the project allowed me to find out so much more about him. So if I had to share anything, it would definitely be that he cared about people. Like he was passionate about serving our people. He was very specific about that. Like I feel like he would help anybody but his goal was to help African Americans. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the and Comrade Bunchy, what was the climate like during that era? Because I know sister and I, uh, like I say, I'm a, I'm probably a little older than the sister, but uh, I don't think you were around that time, obviously. Uh, no, just, I was. Yeah. <laughs> I keep saying I was 50 years too late. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I feel the same way, but but uh, yeah. Comrade Bunchy, talk, talk about that era and what was going down and, and what he had to face as well as you guys uh, during that era in Houston. Well, well, you know, the thing about it, it's just like I tell a lot of these young people that <laughs> some of them talk about, yeah, well, well you know, uh, we need to go back to segregation because we had our own, thing. but they don't realize what it's like to grow up in segregation. I was born in 1952. And just like Bobby said about the courtroom, everything in my world as a young kid was white. You know, everything on TV was white. You know, the school books was Dick and Jane, two white kids running around. And, uh, and uh -huh. so it was uh, the thing that, that really, I always think about my mother, she used to always say, because I told you so. Mm. And a lot of it was because they didn't want to tell you, just like here in Houston, you could not go, you could go to the zoo, but you have Herman Park, which is the biggest park in, in the city. You couldn't go to Herman Park. So you leave the zoo and say, well, I want to go to the park and 
and you, you, your mom or your dad said, well, we, uh, no, no, we're not going to the park. You say, why? Because I said so. Because they didn't want to tell you you was a little black boy or black girl. Mm-hmm. And you could mm-hmm. participate. So uh, it was, you know, it was a whole whole different thing. Even the, even I think about, this, uh, Bobby was a lawyer. But a lot of black people say, well, they wanted a white lawyer. Because a white lawyer was better than a black lawyer. You know, that was the mentality of black people at that time. So just like Bobby said, when he started practicing law after he graduated from Texas Southern University, it was real hard because uh, everything was white. You know, all the judges were white, all the prosecutors were white, the court reporters were white, the jurors were white. So, you know, it, it was uh, it was something hard to deal with, but he did have success. And... Uh, like he, like he said, he won some, he lost some, but he had quite a bit of success, even even uh, to the point where this one uh, white judge, uh, after he'd been practicing for a few years, uh, came up to him and told him that he was a damn good lawyer, and he asked him if uh, he wanted to have sit down and have coffee with him, and Bobby told him that uh, I was wondering what took you so long. And no, no, I don't want to sit down and have coffee with you. Because okay. see, Bobby had principles. You know, that's the thing. A lot of people, oh, this is judge. Oh, yeah, I'll kiss his ass. I'll go sit down with him. But Bobby had principles. Mm-hmm. And he knew who he was. And um, so e- even that, but then to take up cases of activists during that time that nobody else would touch. You know, it's a... Uh, Shandell has sent me this article from four times uh, about Voco's case, and in the beginning it says he was one of the only black lawyers that would. No, he was the only. Mm, uh, He, you know, that would step up and take cases of uh, black activists. You know. And I was going to ask, Sister, um, what uh, led you to become a writer? I don't really feel like that's what I was supposed to be doing. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have always loved to read and write. I have been reading since, excuse me, since around the age of three. And my mom, she told me that I wasn't one of those kids who had to have snacks or a sippy cup. She said, when we went somewhere, the only way to get me to be quiet was with a book. So we took a book everywhere. And... I believe it was just her supporting me and always encouraging me to, like when I was like, I'm bored, go go read a book, go find you something to do, go okay. sit down and read. Then as I got older, I would actually be in the room reading for hours and I would hear, what you doing in there? You need to come something. Well, you told me to go read a book. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I've read several. Um, but I actually went to school. I graduated from Grambling in IT because I knew I couldn't make money okay. working on computers, but I hated it like passion because I was on the hardware side doing troubleshooting and I never stopped writing. So eventually, and I mean eventually way on the out of 40, I kind of figured out this is what I was supposed to be doing and um, I'll be 50 this year. So it's funny how in the last 10 years I've been editing and writing, but this is the year I feel like the train really did start moving. And it has a lot to do with this project on the writing side, but even on the editing side, people are just finding me and I'm thankful for that. I didn't know people actually Google black editors, but I saw a change in that when George Floyd was murdered like all of a sudden we were conscious and aware of where our money was going and we were intentional about supporting each other and so i'm grateful that i get to do what i absolutely enjoy doing okay and uh and again where can people uh get the book right now the book is available on amazon.com okay all right but all of the information okay that they need to know about the book is on bobbyhcaldwell.com. Like okay. the book, um, parts about his life, all of the videos that I've been able to find online, interviews, 
it's all in one central location, bobbyhcarwell.com, which will then lead you to where you can buy the book. Okay. And with Comrade uh, Bunchy, uh, you're one of the greatest storytellers I've ever heard. And you have to tell the story of James Aaron in the courthouse. And there was an incident. Please tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, one thing, you know, we had, we had a, uh, we had a, a program in, in memory of Bobby at Shape Community Center uh, on the uh, 18th of February. And like I told, told the audience, I told them about all the incidents that happened leading up to him representing the Black Panther Party. And I, I told them that we kept them real, real busy. Mm, okay. And, uh, so you had the trial of Charles Boko Freeman, who was uh, uh, changed the flat on the in the car in front of the office. And there's a there's a city ordinance. I don't know if it's still there, but it, 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 it you could not change. I mean, you could not work on a car in the street unless it was an emergency. So it's like changing the flat. Okay. So the police came and uh, they arrested uh, uh, Boko for working on a car in the street. And they said when they got him down to the police station that uh, they found a box of marijuana on him. So they charged him with that. I mean, we were real worried. We thought he was, he was going to prison. You know, because the prosecutors wanted to give him 15 years in a day because anything over 15 years, you couldn't appeal it to the state court. You had to go to the federal courts. Okay. So Bobby, uh, he got this policeman on the stand. And I remember him asking the policeman, well, uh, because they said they didn't find the box of until they got him downtown. <clears throat> so Bobby said, well, isn't it police procedure that before you put somebody in your car that you search them? And so the policeman said, yeah, he said, that's, that's, that's true. He said, but we were in front of the Black Panther Party's office and we were scared. So we just patted him down. And then when we got him downtown, we found a box of marijuana on him. So then Bobby said, well, you saw him working on the engine. He said, yeah, he was working on the engine. So he said, well, was he working on the front of the car or was he working on the back of the car? And so, uh, the police said, yeah, he was working on the front of the car with the hood up. So then Bobby said, you mean to tell me that this is the only Fiat made in the world with the engine in the front? <laughs> and so they're, so they're, so they're, 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 the, the police would say, yeah. And the whole courtroom did what you just did, start oh. laughing. <laughs> even the jury, even the jury wow. started laughing. So, so he was acquitted. Okay. And so as we were, as we were leaving, like I said, we kept them busy. We were walking out, and these uh, uh, county sheriffs were walking in undercover. But you could always tell them because they, they wore these cheap polyester court, uh, coats and uh, patent leather belts and white patent leather shoes. So you always knew who they were. All right. So we walking out the <laughs> building, and one of them, one of them bumped in uh, into James. You know, get out the way, nigga. And James turned around and kicked him dead in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's another case. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so anyway, of course, he got arrested. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, James had a lot of a lot of uh, heart. A lot of, you know, because James took over for Carl once Carl was murdered. So right. yeah. Right. Wow. Well, wow. you you always tell these incredible stories. Uh and uh, and again, uh, I want to thank you for documenting some of those stories because I tell you, uh, you know, uh, once people kind of learn the dynamics of uh, the party back then and the the environment, uh, it's so key uh, to uh, getting understanding. Uh, what do you want both of, for both of you? What do you want people to gain from this book? The people's lawyer. What do you guys want? Uh, what do you hope that uh, people gain by, especially the young people? Personally, having gone through the story, edited, revised, all that good stuff, and then just reading it like one as go to make sure it was good. I felt a sense of knowing, like I better understood 
uh, a particular people that we've come from because I know that the Panthers and all of the people who were busy during the civil rights era paved the way for me. So I felt like I know more about who I am and where I come from. So just walking away with a sense of understanding, um, a sense of belonging, and as, of course, the educational piece, there was a lot of information that I did not know that I have learned since doing this project. So I'm grateful for that. But I would just want people to read it and feel empowered um, to go and research on their own. Um, there, I did see a review, a lady said everything that I really wanted the reader to get. She said she was encouraged, she was inspired, and she also put the book down and started to research because she wanted to know more about the cases that were in the book. She wanted to know more about the people. And that was really my biggest goal, it, educating and informing our people about the okay. things that happened before we even got here that are still relevant today. Okay. And same thing for you, Comrade Bunch. Yeah, well, Sean, that was well said because uh, you know, that's the thing, that's the a point, especially you mentioned uh, young people, uh, uh, like Chandel said, uh, she realized it was like, it's just like at, when we had the uh, the event for Bobby, it was so many people said they didn't know all the things that he had done, mm -hmm. you know, because really Bobby was a, he was a person, uh, he didn't go around bragging or he didn't want, like I said, he could have been, he could have, could have, uh, lived in a big mansion somewhere and drove a big car. Mm -hmm. but like I say, he was about the people. Now, he lived well, and he had a nice home, and he, and he lived well. But, you know, the thing about it is that, especially for the youth, uh, like Chantel, you have to realize why you in the position you're in now is because people sacrifice. Right. You know, uh, like Bobby and other people died or went to prison or, or whatever, so you can ride around in your Mercedes or live in a big house and have your cigar bars and all that stuff. People sacrifice for that. And Bobby Caldwell was one of the ones to sacrifice. Because like I said, I mean, a lot of the cases he took for activists, he did pro bono. Okay. It's like Eugene Locke said that they didn't go looking for him. He came and found them. Okay. You know, they were young kids at U of H. Uh, you know, scared to death because they've been arrested, never been arrested before. Mm -hmm. And he said, Bobby came and found them, okay. you know. Okay. And uh, also, are, are there any plans to go on a tour? Or I know Houston has a big Black National uh, uh, Book Festival. Uh, are any uh, plans on participating in uh, any events? Yes, as Uncle Daddy me the information I do follow up and so I'm looking to going back to Houston a few more times actually I'm trying to plan a, a signing it's just coordinating it while I'm already in Houston with other events uh, okay. any other opportunities that come up I'm definitely open to pursuing those I love to travel so anywhere that I I can go with my laptop where there is some Wi-Fi, or even if not, because I now have my own little device where I can hotspot. So oh, okay. <laughs> have right. stories will travel. I should do a bumper sticker. Have stories will travel. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. And uh and Comrade Bunchy, again, you have such a extraordinary life of uh community service, people service. Uh uh, will there be a a uh a project, a collaboration project uh, coming up, or we can't really talk about that right now? Well, uh, not that anything in the future. You know, one thing we can really start working on, you know, every year we have a uh, commemoration of the life of Carl Hampton. Okay. And that's, and that's always at the end of July, because he was uh, assassinated July 26, 1970. So I think it's going to be on the 29th this year. Okay. And so, you know, we'll start working on that. And then, of course, uh, uh, Bobby Caldwell will be included in that. Okay. And uh, again, I, I want to, I want to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, my sister. I was just going to say, I think he was asking you about commemorating all those great stories that you're telling. Are we, are we doing anything about those stories that you're holding on to? Or do you need to announce <laughs> it later on or something like that? Could you yeah. come back on and announce that? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you for clarifying. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so Shandell, yeah, we're gonna get together and work on uh, putting everything together. Cause like I said, I I I have a whole journal and uh I, I write stuff down and, and uh Shandell uh hooked me up on my phone where I can just uh, record stuff because the journal I have. I'll have something down, like I'll pick it up now. Let me see. I, and I'll, uh, it'll be just like I wrote down. Let's see. Uh, you know, it'll be something now. If you saw it, okay, it says Huey's dad and mom. Right. Now, if you just saw that, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. But I was just talking about them as people. And uh, <laughs> I tell. <laughs> I tell people this something. This is the first time I said it on, online. I was at I was at Huey's uh, parents' house one time, because Huey's dad had become a paralegic, and so Commerce would go over there to help help his mom out. You know, take him to the store, take him to the doctor and stuff. So one day we sitting there in the kitchen, and Huey came in, and Huey's dad said, "Huey, you ain't shit." <laughs> you ain't never been shit. You ain't never gonna be shit. And so, so people ask, well, what did Huey say? Huey started laughing. Oh, my <laughs> that's, goodness. That's his dad, you know what I'm saying? But, but he loved his dad. His dad loved him. Right. But you know, just little personal things like that. <laughs> like, Whoa. <laughs> if I said that, I'd been in big trouble. You know? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, it's, um, it's oh, interesting. Man. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it's interesting about the journal because when I got Uncle Bobo's original notes, that's what they looked like. Okay. Like he would just have something like Mickey Leland. Right. Okay. Right. I don't know anything about Mickey Leland. I, I was Googling Mickey Leland. I now know that he died in a plane crash um, a long, long, long time ago. But when I went back to Uncle Bobo, because he, that name had probably been on a piece of paper for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I said, what did you want to say about Mickey Leland? And he said, I don't know. And so it was like that part I couldn't capture. So there were several things that he just had scribbled. And I was like, okay, I'll find as much information as I can find, but I still need you to tell me your part in it. Like, why was it relevant enough for you to write it down? And unfortunately he was 88, which was a blessing, but he couldn't remember what he initially wanted to say about them, the people who were supposed to have done the project. Although I feel like now maybe I was supposed to do the project, okay. actually got it done. So it's funny that Uncle Daddy is doing the same thing. So <laughs> beautiful. Look, looking forward to name. it. Yes. yes. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, you know, we're about to close on up. How can both people? Uh, I should say, how can people follow both of you on social media or any website or contact? I did the side eye look because I am not strong in social media. That is not my gift. Okay. But I do have, I have an Instagram. It's just I and my first name, Shondale, I-S-H-A-U-N-D-A-L-E. But the most information is on my website, ShondaleRenee.com, S-H-A-U-N-D-A-L-E-R-E-N-A.com. Okay. And in closing, uh, Comrade Bunch, your information? Yeah, well, uh, you can uh, look up uh, on Google or uh, YouTube, John Bunchy Career, and uh, a lot of things I've done will pop up. And then on Facebook and Instagram, it's just John Career. Okay. And so, yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank both of you for this tremendous book. And uh, once, uh, if people get it from Amazon, make sure you write a, a review on the book. It is fantastic from chapter one through 15, uh, everything before that and after. So uh, make sure you go out and get this, The People's Lawyer uh, by uh, Shondell R. Johnson and attorney Bobby Caldwell, rest in power. Again, I want to thank both of you for coming on the show. And I look forward to speaking with you uh, both uh, about some of the future projects. Sounds Thank good. you again. Thank you. Have a great Bye, day. Uncle Daddy. <laughs> Take care now. All, right. all power to the people. Bye -bye. All, all power to the people. Yes, sir.